Well, good morning. I think Brother Luke, he's a little partial to that Army flag because that's what he was in. Army flag's right there. You see where the Navy's at, don't you? You see what kind of tie I've got on? And remember, I put these flags up, so that's where it goes. <laughs> Haven't we had a beautiful week this week? I mean, it's just been so beautiful. And God is so gracious to us, and he blesses us with so many blessings. Uh, Veterans Day is 11th. Brother Luke's already mentioned that. It, it, they're celebrating this, uh, this Friday. So we thought it would be better to do it today than after. It's always better. Brother Bill told me last Sunday that it's always better to do it before something than after something. So that's the reason why we're doing it today. But we never want to fail to give our recognition and everything to the veterans of this great nation. We never want to fail to give a recognition to the ones who are serving today. Uh, there's only 1%, a little less than 1% of the population of the United States that serves and protects this great nation. So I, I feel like uh, it, it, we just need to do a little bit special when we see a service member or something like that in uniform, then we just need to go up to him and shake his hand or their hand, his or hers, and shake their hand and say, we do appreciate what you're doing. We do appreciate your service. And this morning... Everybody that has served in the military or is serving now, then we want you to stand. We want to give you recognition and we want you to stand and recognize you. <laughs> and thank you for everything that you've done. My mom gave me a poem and the poem's real long. The only part I want to read is at the very end. It says, for all who love this country, and took up so brave and true. It's only for her rights we fight. God bless the red, white, and blue. So as we're praying for our veterans, the ones who are, who are serving uh, today, then let's always pray for our country that God will still continue to bless this great nation that we live in.
appreciate the choir singing. If you have your Bibles, we're looking at Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. While you're turning there, let me make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we need to remember the family of Aaron's grandmother. She passed away. Let's pray for them. Visitation will be on Tuesday from 5 till 7 at Weatherford's uh, funeral home in Oak Ridge. Her name is Melba Pittman. Uh, again, that's the mamaw of Aaron Hensley, so pray for that family. Uh, pray for the family of the young man that was killed tragically a couple of days ago. Uh, it's my understanding that he was with us uh, during our fall fling, and uh, you never know, do you? I mean, you never know what the next day is going to hold, but their family desperately needs our prayers. And, and then we need to pray for our election. This Tuesday, uh, our world will change one way or the other. And uh, we need to pray. We need to ask God to guide us in, in what we need to do. I believe that we need to be good Christians, but we also uh, need to be good citizens. And I believe those both work together. And do pray for that. Pray for the election that's also going, local elections in Oliver Springs. They'll be voting on uh, alcohol uh, on premises uh, to uh, try to get that legalized. And uh, my suggestion to you is to vote against it. Strongly suggestion that you vote against it. So if you know somebody, if you don't live in Oliver Springs within the city limits, uh, you may know somebody that lives there, maybe a family member, maybe a friend. Uh, talk to them about it between now and Tuesday. Very important, a very important election down there, and so do pray for that. If you found Mark chapter 14, I'm going to ask you to stand just a moment, uh, just share a couple of things with you before you do that. Next Sunday night, no, you can be seated just for a moment. I'm sorry, I got you mixed up, or I got mixed up, got you mixed up. Next Sunday night, the Lord willing, I, I'm going to... Uh, we're going to show the DVD about Ken Trivet and his wife Sherry uh, moved to South Dakota uh, in, not, in 2012 and they've been on the mission field since then. That's been four years. Uh, I looked at part of the video and uh, not went through it all, but it's just about 10 minutes long and uh, it's really uh, packed with information. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed about it, the uh, average age uh, life span of a person, a man on that reservation is 49 years old. Whereas across the nation, it's about 72, 73 years old. And a lot of problems they're having, but Ken and his wife, Sherry, have been faithful to go out there and give up a lot to go out there and do the work of God. So we'll share that next Sunday night, and uh, so I hope you'll be here with us. Uh, the Rochesters will be with us on the Sunday night before Thanksgiving. Very powerful Southern Gospel group. You'll enjoy them. I promise you, you'll enjoy them. And if you don't enjoy them, the only thing I can say is that you need to get saved. Saved people enjoy their gospel, their gospel singing. I guarantee you, it'll be a blessing. On that same night, uh, Daniel that got saved here last Sunday night, we're going to baptize him on that Sunday night. And so it's going to be a, a power-packed evening. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, I heard about a man that went on a business trip to Miami. And as soon as he got there, he sent back an email to his wife and uh, unfortunately uh, he got the address mixed up a little bit and it went to the wrong place a and it went to the wife of a preacher that had just recently died and the email said this said uh, uh, arrive, sa arrive safely but it sure is hot down here <laughs> sometimes we can mess up big can't we uh, I will preach to you today about a man that Messed up royally, and we still talk about it today. We'll talk to you about Simon Peter. Uh, Simon Peter, old foot in the mouth, preacher, uh, that was constantly, seemingly getting himself in hot water and saying things that he had to take back later. Uh, I want to talk to you about the fall of Simon Peter. We can all relate to him. I can. I believe that you probably can because uh, sometimes we say things that uh, just don't turn out the right way. And sometimes we do put our foot in our mouth and we make mistakes just like Simon Peter. Uh, Paul, in a sense, he said, I'm like Simon Peter. He wrote in Romans chapter 7, he said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. O wretched man that I am. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to fail. The Bible says we all sin, we all come short 
of the glory of God. I've blowed it time and time again. So have you. Uh, Peter it was a man that was saved, and yet he messed up. Would you stand this morning? Let's read the, the uh, story about Peter's uh, fumble and his mess up in uh, Mark chapter number 14, verses 53 and verse 54. And then we're going to skip down to verse 66. Verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Let's skip down to verse 66. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again, and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by again said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew, and, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask this morning that as we study the life of Simon Peter, that we'll realize, uh, Lord, yes, we mess up. Lord, even greater than that, we'll realize that you're the God of the second chance. You're the God that forgives us of all of our sins. If we'll just repent and confess to you, Lord, that we have failed. Lord, you eagerly await uh, the opportunity to forgive us and restore us. And Lord, put us back in the work, Lord, that you've called us to do. Now use me this morning, Father, for your honor, for your glory. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I, I think the fall and the repentance and the restoration of Simon Peter tells us that no matter how far you fall, and no matter how bad you messed up, if you'll just repent of your sins and uh, come to Jesus, you'll find him waiting with welcome arms. He said, whosoever will, let him come unto me. I'm thankful that we have a God that is a forgiving God. Uh, we all sin. Uh, the person that says they have no sin, the Bible says, is a liar. Uh, sometimes our failures are secretive. Uh, only ourself and God knows about it. And then sometimes there's a small group of uh, maybe folks that are around us that they know about our failure. And then sometimes it seems like everybody knows that we have failed. I think back to the preachers in the 80s. I think about Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker. When they failed, I mean it not only made local news and national news, but that news went all around the world that they had failed. Simon Peter failed, and everybody knows about it. We still talk about it today. I'm preaching about it this morning. Sometimes our failures, they uh, seems like everybody in the world knows about it. Simon Peter finds himself in this story in denial of the Lord Jesus, and I don't know him. The cross is casting a shadow across the Savior. The Last Supper has taken place. The prayer of Gethsemane is over. The kiss of betrayal has happened They've come and they've arrested Jesus. And now our Lord is surrounded by a mob that is thirsty for blood of this innocent man. And by the way, if there was ever a time that our Lord needed a friend, it's now. But instead of defending Jesus, Peter denies Jesus. I want to share with you some things concerning the denial of Peter in this story. First of all, I want you to think with me about the cause of spiritual failure. We all fail. Sometimes it's the preacher that uh, gets involved in immorality. Uh, sometimes it's the person that's sitting on the pew. Sometimes, in fact, many times, most of the time, it's that person that you and I look at when we look in the mirror. Because we've all sinned. We all come short of the glory of God. Uh, it sometimes shocks us because we think, why, wow, they would never fall. They would never fail. That's what I used to think about Jimmy Swagger. Used to watch Jimmy Swagger when I get ready for church on Sunday mornings, listen to him preach. And uh, even though our doctrine was different, he had a different idea about theology. And, and yet I was so captured by him. It seemed like that God uh, really had his hand on Jimmy Swagger. And 
And, and I even told some men one day, they, after Jim Baker had messed up and failed, I told some men at work, I said, uh, that will never happen to Jimmy Swaggart. And within a week's time, the exact same thing happened to him. And I've been reminded that we're not to put our confidence in men. Because all men fail. All men sin and come short of God's glory. But the question this morning that I believe that we need to really uh, try to get an answer to is why does it happen? We know it happens, but why does it happen? And, and maybe in finding out the reason that it happens, it will help you and I to avoid those pitfalls and the temptation of Satan when he comes against us because I promise you this morning, he's already got his eye on you. And he's already making plans for your fall and for your failure. Notice the cause of spiritual failure. Uh, first of all, it was pride. Pride in the life of Peter. The Bible says in verse 27 in this same chapter, Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Now, Lord, these other guys may fall. They may fail, but, Lord, I'm better than that. After all, Jesus, didn't you call me the rock? Lord, you know that I would never fail you. Jesus again says to Peter, Verily I say unto you that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Jesus said, Oh, yes, Peter, you're going to deny me. Not once, not twice, but three times. And Peter again, his pride won't let him back down because in verse 31, he speaketh the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. In any wise, likewise also said they all. I believe that Peter in a sense is saying this, Lord, you really don't know me. You don't know what kind of man that I am. Lord, you'll soon discover that all these other guys may run off and forsake you, but if there's anybody you can count on, you can count on me. Pride got the best of Simon Peter. The Bible says in Proverbs 11 and 2, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. In Proverbs 16 and verse 18, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I'm talking maybe to a man this morning that says, I love Jesus and, and, and I love my wife and, and I'm so close to God that uh, it won't hurt if I go out to lunch with a female co-worker. I'm too strong to fall. I'm too close to God to fall. I love my wife uh, too much to fall. Listen to me, dear friend. The Bible says if a man thinks that he stands, he needs to take heed lest he fall. You're, dear friend, you're just made of flesh and blood just like I am and just like Simon Peter was. Simon Peter said, Lord, I'll never fail you. And yet he did. And yet he fell and his fall was great. The person that thinks that they'll never fall, that they'll never mess up their life because of sin, they're probably the next one in line that we're going to hear about or we'll read about their failure and their fall. The Bible teaches us that, uh, dear friend, that pride is a destroyer of men. Somebody said this. I love this quote. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. Let me just assume this morning that uh, think about living in a neighborhood where there's no robberies and uh, nobody's been broken into and, and it's been like that for as long as you can remember you know what happens sometimes in a case like that we get careless and we begin to leave our doors unlocked and, and, and we begin to think that it's never happened here and that means it never will happen and I'm telling you when we get careless that's when the thief comes Listen to me very carefully. We need to guard our hearts even more than we guard our homes. And we need to understand, dear friend, that there's nobody that is so strong uh, that if they don't look to God and keep themselves in touch with the Lord Jesus Christ, when Satan comes, he'll come at a time that they expect him the least. And the Bible says, how the mighty are fallen. Peter fell. 
Dear friend, this morning, understand that you can fall. Notice the cause of the fall. And the Old Testament tells us about some great saints that got filled with pride and it brought them down. You remember the Garden of Eden? You know who led to that fall? It was Satan himself. Satan, the one that got cast out of heaven because of his pride. The Bible says, oh, Lucifer was brought down. Jesus himself said, I saw him falling from heaven like lightning. Lightning travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. Jesus said, I got rid of that glory robber in a hurry. Satan was cast to this earth, and the Bible says that he came and he began to tempt Eve. And you know the story. Uh, Satan said to her, says, has God said that you shall not eat of this fruit? He said, Eve said, he don't know what he's talking about. He don't want you to know that as soon as you eat this fruit, you'll become just like God. What was it that caused her to take that fruit? Dear friend, it was pride. Because Satan had already convinced her, if you'll just eat that fruit, you'll be just like God. And pride led to her downfall. What about King Saul? King Saul, that great warrior that was raised up to be the first king of Israel. But the Bible says that God eventually regretted that he had even made uh, Saul king. And when the prophet Samuel came to him, uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, King Saul, in 1 Samuel 15, he had already set up a monument to himself. He is so proud of himself. Hey, I'm the king of Israel. I mean, there's nobody as powerful as me. Listen to me, dear friend. Whenever you begin to write your own press release and uh, you begin to even believe your own press release, you're headed for a fall. Whenever you begin to think, it could never happen to me, take heed lest you fall. King Uzziah, the king in the days of Isaiah, the Bible says that he was a young man, a powerful man. In fact, he in the, was a godly king, but pride got the best of him also. First Chronicle or Second Chronicles 26 and 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And God struck him with leprosy. King Uzziah got to thinking, I'm better than the priest. I'm the king. I can do whatever I want to. That was the priest's job. That didn't belong to the king. But the Bible says he got lifted up. Pride brought him down. And the next thing you know, he's an exile in his own country. He is behind walls and cannot go out in public because now, because of pride, he has leprosy. Pride brought him to his knees. You know about the pride of David. David, the king of Israel, as long as he was on the run, as long as Saul was seeking his life, he was an humble man, a man after God's own heart. But then he got lifted up and got to thinking, I can have anything that I want. It all belongs to me. And took the wife of one of his his great soldiers, uh, took the wife uh, of a man, uh, the wife that didn't belong to him. And you know the rest of the story. Pride brought him down. Pride brought him to the place where he had to look up and say, I have sinned. What about Samson? Mighty, mighty man of God. A man that was under the Nazarite vow. And yet God said, you can't cut your hair because that was a part of the vow. And he began to play around with sin, thinking that it could never touch him. You know about the story of Delilah when she calls in that that Philistine barber and cuts off the locks off 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 of his head. And the Bible says that she said then, Samson the Philistine be upon thee. And in his pride, the Bible says, he wished not that the Lord had departed from him. Pride, I believe it's one of the greatest dangers in the life of a Christian. When you hear somebody, uh, a preacher, talk about lying or adultery or stealing, and any of those things that are sin, and you think that, and that's meant for somebody else. Listen to me, you're setting yourself up as a candidate to be the one, the next one that falls. The second cause for Peter's denial was prayerlessness. He failed to pray. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and left the disciples, the other disciples, uh, back away. And he said, boys, I want you to go with me. I, I, I need to pray to my Father. 
Bible says that Jesus came back not once, not twice, but three times. And all three times he found those men asleep. Instead of praying, they're sleeping. I, I believe that Jesus, in a sense, he's begging Peter and saying, get off your high horse and get on your face before God in prayer. But he wasn't praying. He was sleeping. Pride will get you like an airplane pilot that puts an airplane on autopilot and doesn't have any gas in the tank. It doesn't matter how good his GPS system is. Dear friend, eventually that plane is going down. And just like that plane that goes down, whenever you and I begin to neglect uh, the, the realization that uh, without God we can do nothing, we're headed for a fall. He's like the man that says, I don't need to go to church every week. I don't need to study my Bible. I don't need to get in a Bible study class. I mean, others need that. Oh, but I've grown up. I'm too old now for that. I'm too big for that. Listen to me. As long as you live, I don't care if God allows you to live to be 110 years old. You never get too old to get your nose between the pages of this blessed book and get on your knees before God and acknowledge God. I can't do anything, but Lord, you can do it all. You need to realize that. Oh, it was, it was pride and prayerlessness. And then it was pressure that led to his fall. The Bible says in verse 64 through verse 67 that they condemned Jesus to death. They began to spit upon him and saying, prophesy unto us who it is. After that, they blindfolded him, began to hit him with their fists and with a reed. And Peter was beneath in the palace. And there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, Art thou, uh, and thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Now Christ is on trial. The Bible says he's been condemned to death. Three different times somebody comes and they make the accusation, you was with Jesus of Nazareth. And three different times he says, I was not. I don't even know the man. Three different times. Oh, dear friend, Peter is within eyeshot of Jesus and yet he denies him. You know, as long as, as Jesus is walking on the water and Peter gets invited to come out and walk with him, Peter will acknowledge, yes, I know that man. And when Jesus is healing the lepers and, and he's giving sight to the blind and great throngs of people have fallen, Jesus, Peter is more than glad to say, hey, I'm his right-hand man. I mean, as long as things are going his way. Now Jesus is condemned to death. and They come to Peter and, and the Bible says that they asked Peter, said, wasn't you with him? He said, no. And he even began to curse and deny that he even knew the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, dear friend, it's easy to be spiritual when everything's going our way. But I'm telling you, when the pressure is on, that's when you and I need to make up our minds. We're going to stand for God. It doesn't matter what takes place. It doesn't matter what happens. We're going to stand for God. Notice it was the, the causes of spiritual failure, pride, prayerlessness, and pressure. Now I want you to notice the consequences of spiritual failure. First of all, it's strained relationships. Verse 72, and the second time the cock crew, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. The other gospel writers tell us he wept bitterly. That's the consequences uh, dear friend of spiritual failure. There was a time when fellowship was sweet and, and it was wonderful whenever Peter walked with the Lord and talked with the Lord and saw the great things that the Savior did. There was a time when Peter could boldly say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's a time, uh, dear friend, when Peter, my friend, was on uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. And we see the love of Simon Peter when Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. Now, it was sort of silly what he said, but I'm telling you, you can see his heart. He loves the Lord. He loves the Lord. And I believe down deep within his heart, he really believes I could never fail him. 
And yet he does. Yet he does. Just a few hours earlier, Peter had made the statement, I will never forsake thee. Lord, I'll never let you down. There may be somebody here today, you can remember back to a time, there was nothing between you and the Savior. When you walked in sweet fellowship with the Lord and, and you enjoyed the relationship that you had with Him. And maybe back then you thought, I'm so glad it's this way and I'm glad it'll always be this way. And yet, dear friend, the time has come and you're sitting here now and you're just remembering how it used to be. Because just like Simon Peter, there are many that because of pride and because they failed to pray and because of the pressure, they made the statement, I, I, I'll never leave the Lord. I'll never forsake God. And, and yet here you are. There's a time when he was able to pray the prayer of David. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And now when the pressure comes, there's a tendency to run and hide. That's why a lot of people don't come to church anymore. You know the reason? It's because the pressure has come. The pressure has come and, and dear friend, instead of running to God, running away from God. That is absolutely the dumbest thing that you can do. When pressure comes, you need the Lord. You don't need to run away from Him. You need to run to Him. And I want to remind you that if there's a strained relationship between you and the Heavenly Father, God didn't move, you moved. God didn't fail, you failed. And it's up to you to come back and say like David later would say, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. It's in your court right now, dear friend. It's up to you. And understand this, that when you come back to God, he will welcome you with open arms. And he's not going to say to you, you're a sorry excuse for a Christian. I knew you'd mess up. That's not the God that we serve. Tell you, it's illustrated in the prodigal's father. The Bible says the prodigal had went out and he he had dirtied the name of his family, and his sin was well known. He had a reputation of being a vile sinner. He even got to the place where he lives in the hog pen. But I want you to know that when he came to his senses and he came back to the father, the father saw him afar off and began to run toward the son. That's what the Father, our Heavenly Father does. We mess up. If we'll just start making that, that first step toward Him, I'll promise you He'll meet you more than halfway. That's just the way that He is. It results in strained relationships. It results in spiritual restlessness. Verse number 20, 72, And when He thought thereon, He wept. Matthew and Luke says He wept bitterly. That word bitterly means piercing, sharp, violent. The Greeks used to use that word to describe an earthquake. And, and uh, what it really means, whenever Peter began to weep, he is weeping violently. And he's almost in convulsions. He's shaking when he weeps. It has broken his heart. And he realizes, I've done what I said I would never do. I have denied the Lord. Ever, ever, Christian, I'm talking about if you really belong to God, you cannot stay away from God and stay happy. This morning, you can make all the claims that you want to make. You can say, I'm a Christian, and I'm living out in sin, and I'm enjoying it. It never bothers me. Then all that says to everybody around you, you didn't have it to begin with. God loves you too much if you're saved to let you stay in sin and be happy. Peter wept bitterly. I mean, he almost went into convulsions. He is shaking all over like an earthquake. Peter later would describe a man that uh, was just like him. He'll describe Lot in his writings. Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in sin and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. I believe when Peter wrote that, he said, I, I was just like him. As he penned those words as the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's why God allowed Peter to write those words. Because Peter could better relate to Lot than any of the other disciples. Lot got out of the will of God. And Peter said, I did the same thing. You know the most miserable person in the world? It's not the lost person. 
It's the person that knows God but is out of the will of God. The ways of a transgressor are what? They're hard. God makes it uncomfortable whenever you're out of his will. God's way said, come home. You've not failed me so bad that I can't fix it for you. That's what he'll say to Peter later on. You've not blown it so bad that I can't take the broken pieces and put them back together again. There's a strained relationship between him and the Father, between him and the Savior. Run off and hid himself and, and distance himself from Jesus. And then there was that restlessness. Run out of that place, weeping bitterly. And then last of all, he has a stained reputation. That's a consequence of rebelling against God. That's a consequence of sin. Now we know a lot of things about Peter. We know that he was one of the only two men that ever walked on water. Jesus Christ being the other one. We know that he had a miraculous catch of fish. The Bible says he caught so many fish that it broke the nets and they had to call other ships to come in and help them to bring in the bounty. We know that. We know that Peter saw the transfiguration, was there. We know that about him. We know that God used Simon Peter to heal the sick and cast out demons. Used of God to write two books of the Bible. Used of God to help John Mark when he wrote the Gospel of Mark. We know all of those things about Peter. And I tell you, you know the thing that we remember most? He denied the Lord. It'll stain your reputation. You stay out in sin, refuse uh, to acknowledge that he is, he is God. And, and yes, I fail and stay close to him. You're on the verge of messing up your reputation just like Peter did. That's what we remember about him. There's some things that you and I can do. That, they, that will negate every good thing we've ever done. I tell you this morning, if I were to go out and, and I were to commit adultery and the word got out, you know what they're going to remember about me? It's not these years that I've preached the gospel. It, it's not hey, any of the good things that I've done. I'll go down in history and the only thing that folks are going to bring up about me is my failure. So I'm telling you this morning, if you have failed, God will forgive you. If you haven't failed, think about the consequences. And then last of all, I'm glad there's a cure for spiritual failure. God has a cure. You know, the first thing that, that is required for, to be cured of spiritual failure, repentance. It's a sad day in America, in the pulpits across this land, that men will not preach repentance. Every day is not a Friday. And everything that happens to you is not always good. There's going to be some hardships along the way. And sin is still sin. And God's men have a mandate to preach the whole counsel of God. Yes, preach heaven. But preach that just as sure as there's a heaven, there's a hell. That's my calling of God. That's what God's called me to do, to preach the word of God. The Bible says here that he remembered the word. Listen to that in verse 72. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. That's the word of God. That's God in flesh. He remembered the word of God. The Bible says he wept bitterly. I don't believe those were crocodile tears. I believe those are genuine. That he is heartbroken. I have messed it up. I've done what I said I wouldn't do. And he wept bitterly. You know the difference between, there's a difference between crocodile tears and genuine tears. I've seen folks over the years come to the altar and I've actually seen them saturate the carpet. I've seen them come and get up and, and say I'm going to live for God and go right out those doors and live just like they lived when they were still in sin. I'm telling you, you know the difference between genuine tears and, and those crocodile tears? If you're really uh, sincere about repentance toward God, it'll bring about a change in your behavior. You won't do the same things that you used to do. You'll come out from among the world. Genuine repentance brings a change in behavior. Remember, to show you that Peter had really repented, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came and fell upon them. Peter stands and preaches to that same crowd that a few days earlier had cried out concerning Jesus, crucify him. 
And when Peter was asked, are you with him? Peter said, no. Now he's proudly and boldly declaring, I'm with him, I'm for him, whatever the cost. And buddy, he means it now. Stands for the other 11. Not ashamed of the Lord that has called him into the ministry and saved his soul. He's not ashamed of him now. Dear friend, that tells me that Peter really did repent. That he was sorry for his sins. The Bible says that in Acts chapter 3 that they healed the man at the gate called Beautiful. And they got in trouble for it. They're threatened. You can't preach Jesus anymore. Went before the Sanhedrin and said, Now, we're not, we're not going to do anything to you because they're afraid of the people. But this is what we command. You don't preach Jesus anymore. Peter went out. First thing he did when they took the, took the chains off of him and let him out of his cell, he went out into the courtyard and declared, Jesus Christ is Lord. Different man now, isn't he? After he's repented. The Bible says in Acts 4, verse 19 and 20, that Peter answered unto them, said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. What a difference. I mean, a few days earlier, I don't know him. And now, saying to the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Israel in that day, saying to them, I can't help it. I've got to preach Jesus. Tell you what a difference. What a difference that made. The Bible says that, again, they're being commanded not to preach anymore in that name. Listen to this in Acts chapter 5. They departed from the presence of the council. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus. I'm telling you, real repentance will make a change. The cure for spiritual failure is repentance. You've got to repent. It just simply, repentance means you turn 180 degrees. You turn from sin. You turn to God. And then secondly... I want you to notice that the cure for spiritual failure is restoration. And only God can do that. God did that for Peter. God can do that for you. After the crucifixion, the women go to the tomb. And they're looking for Jesus. And the angel meets them there and says, He is not here. He is risen. And we want you to go back and tell his disciples and Peter. Wonder why he didn't say, You go back and tell his disciples and John. But no, that's not what the angel said. You go back and tell those disciples and Peter. That angel said, I want you to make sure Peter gets the news. He is risen. He is risen from the dead. I believe it was what God's way of saying to Peter, I'm not done with you. There's hope. Remember what Jesus said to Peter in Luke 22 and 31. Satan hath desired to have thee that he may sift thee as wheat, but I prayed for thee. What better prayer partner could you have than Jesus? I mean, Peter's messed up, and yet the Lord's praying for him. He said, I'm praying that, that you be converted. Not talking about being saved. Peter is saved. But I pray that whenever you make up your mind and you set your heart that you're going to serve me no matter what the consequences, that after that, then you go and strengthen your brothers. Simon, I'm praying for you. I know you're going to fail. And I'm praying that your faith don't fail. And when you repent and come back to me, I want you to know I've still got a job for you to do. But that just makes me want to run. That God, and knowing my failures and my sins, and yet he reminds me of the same thing. If you'll just repent of your sins, I'm not done with you. I'm not finished with you. Then last of all, redeployment. Put him right back in the work. The Bible says that Peter, Peter, Simon Peter, chosen to preach the first message in the New Testament church. Preaches. And they cry out. It must have been a powerful message because they cry out, what must we do to be saved? And listen to what he says. And he knows about this in Acts 2 and 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And buddy, what an effect it had. Acts 2 and 41. And there were the same day added unto them about 3,000 souls. Don't tell me, dear friend, that your failure is final or it's fatal. God's still got a work for you to do. 
within weeks of this famous failure, Peter is again standing boldly for God and souls by the thousands who are coming to know Christ as their Savior. If you're away from God, repent of your sins. He'll forgive you, he'll restore you, and he'll redeploy you. Put you in a work. It may not be the same work that you had before, but he's still got a work for you to do. New Year's Day, 1929, the Rose Bowl. UCLA was playing Georgia Tech. And uh, UCLA had the ball, and uh, their All-American center hiked the ball, and somehow there was a fumble. And, and Georgia Tech picked it up. And the next thing you know, Georgia Tech's player fumbles it. And Roy Wrongway Regals, after that day, that's what he became known as. He picked up that ball, and he began to run through that crowd of, uh, of uh, football players, and, I mean, just shucking and jiving to get to the end zone. And, I mean, he, he lowers his head, and, and he travels 69 yards the wrong way. The only thing that kept it from being a touchdown for the other team was that his own quarterback tackled him on the one-yard line. <laughs> but this is what's amazing about that. Can you imagine messing up like that in, in front of thousands and thousands of people? You can imagine what Roy Riggles, what he felt like. They go into the locker room. It's halftime. And while they're there, why, uh, Coach Nibs Price says to him, said, I want you to suit up. I'm not going back in, coach. I said, suit up. I'm not going back in, coach. I told you to get your suit back on. And this is what the coach said. This game is only half over. Get your helmet on. And listen to me this morning. I believe that there's a God in heaven that's saying to those of us that have failed and we've went the wrong way. Put on your Christian armor. Don't you give up. It's not over until I say it's over.